So now I'm excited to introduce our, our next pair of guests. Uh, we have Andy Bird, who is the CEO of Pearson. Uh, Andy previously worked at Disney, where he served as the president and chairman of Walt Disney International. Uh, and Andy is going to be joined by Naya Butler Craig. Um, Naya is a 2021 Forbes 30 Under 30 influencer in STEM. Uh, she's a current aerospace engineering PhD student and an aspiring mission specialist astronaut. So we're really exciting to have them both here. Uh, and they're going to be talking about lessons from the entertainment industry and what Pearson is doing with young influencers and creators. So we're really excited for their conversation. And please give it up for Andy and Naya. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Um, well, you know who I am. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you know a bit about Naya, but Naya, why don't you do a proper introduction? Absolutely. Uh, so thank you all for being here. My name is Naya Butler-Craig. I'm a PhD student in aerospace engineering and a STEM influencer. I'm known on the web as Astro Naya. <laughs> yeah. You should... Thank you. <laughs> I know that most of us aren't in the core demographic for TikTok and Instagram and things like that. I certainly am not. But I strongly urge that you um, follow uh, Naya's feeds. Uh, it's really, really fascinating. Thank you. And also, Naya's um, working, if you are of that age, then you get your news not from the television, but from um, a, a, a channel called Now This News. Absolutely. And today, was it today we launched or yesterday? Yesterday. I think. Yesterday, uh, we launched uh, Learn This, a series hosted by our student in residence, yes. Naya. Um, and the first episode is around um, sustainability. Yes, sir, within clothing, in the clothing industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so please check out Learn This on Instagram and Twitter and... TikTok and all yes. those other great things. <laughs> Facebook, yes. Anyway, we're, we're here, as, as mentioned, to, to talk a bit about a bit about what Pearson's up to, a bit about Naya's world and the intersection of the two as we see uh, the education and learning sector really transform itself um, to become applicable to the consumer, <laughs> the student, and thinking about the student as a consumer. And Naya and I also share some things in common, a, a love of good, good music. Yes. I started off as a, in the radio business uh, when I was 17, and music still plays a very important part of my life. Um, and, you know, we both have a mission to, to make, you know, learning more engaging and inspiring with um, digital content. Absolutely. So my background, as you heard, is... Um, radio and then entertainment. I spent four years working at Virgin, um, joined, worked for a, a gentleman you may have heard called Ted Turner, and we launched a channel you may have heard of called Cartoon Network. Um, so I was responsible for that for 10 years, overseeing that sort of business, which was kind of cool. Very cool. Taking the Hanna-Barbera library and creating Powerpuff Girls and <laughs> Dexter's Laboratory and Johnny Bravo and all of that cool stuff. And then um, uh, I had the great fortune of joining the Walt Disney Company um, back in the day. <laughs> and um, uh, Disney wasn't in a great place. Not many people remember this, but 15, 18 years ago, um, Disney's stock price was 15 bucks. Wow. And wow. there was a lot of, lot of um, in, in investor um, um, troubles. And uh, there was a gentleman called Bob Iger who's written a really good book, and he was my boss for 15 years, and we set about transforming the company. And I did that, and really I had cool. a real interest and passion around learning, and um, had decided to retire. I had two sons who'd gone through um, uh, NYU. They went to Gallatin at NYU. Okay. And I um, was happily enjoying retirement when I got a call to join the board of Pearson. So I joined Pearson as a board member just over a year ago, and they were looking for a CEO. There was a pandemic on. I had nothing else to do. And I thought, this is kind of cool, and maybe we'll dig into this, because I also saw a lot of parallels between the disruption that had happened in the media industry, 
mm. and the disruption that's about to happen and is happening, and the pandemic's acted as an accelerant, in the, in the space of learning. Um, so that's, that's a bit about me and, and, you know, we've been on this journey. Um, last week we launched Pearson Plus, uh, which is a, a, a different way of, of, of uh, allowing students affordable um, uh, to, to access our, our, our textbooks and study aids and everything like that in a, an affordable way. It's, it's got a really great reception. We utilized over 2,000 students in terms of developing it, but it's really just the, the start of um, uh, uh, what we see as becoming a digital ecosystem. Very cool. It's very cool. Well, very. we'll, we'll see. We're, <laughs> we're, we're starting off. Um, and, and you are building a, you know, a real community as a STEM role model. Um, and I thought, you know, between us, um, we can, um, you know, share some insights. So let's, if I may, Absolutely. start with your good self. <laughs> Um, so there are hundreds of STEM influencers, you know, on social media, but you've carved out a particular niche with aerospace. You know, what's it about your content that is really resonating? I would definitely say that at this current moment, science and social justice are both having a moment and are becoming a lot more talked about in mainstream media. Um, and I think the overlap between those two, having a black STEM role model has become a lot more poignant in this time. And um, I'm always amplifying other black STEM role models and obviously sharing my own journey for the purpose of inspiring, but I think the overlap between those two conversations has definitely resonated with a lot of people. Um, another core, or one of the core uh, pillars of my platform is authenticity. So I don't just share the ups of what I do. I like to share the, the failures, the hardships, the shortcomings, um, because my goal is to be relatable and tangible. And I think that always resonates with people because they think that they can't do what I do because say they failed a class. Well, I failed a class. Uh, say they are not good at math. I used to suck at math. <laughs> and now I'm an aerospace engineer getting a PhD. And so um, I think those are the two things that I've really um, sold the deal for a lot of people to not just follow me, but to engage with me, to learn from me too. So that was really your motivation to, to sort of start, you know, posting your videos and everything like that, was to kind of show your true authentic self. Absolutely. And the journey in that it takes because Instead, I can't mentor everybody individually, so it's always very nice to be able to make a video about what I do. So people can follow along, say, oh, I want to do this too, or maybe I don't want to do this. Oh, she got this fellowship, maybe I should apply for it. So. No, it's really, really cool. And, and tell us a bit about the actual process, because, you know, there are literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people trying to become you know, social influencers, Absolutely. you know, what, how, do, you know, how do you go about that process to ensure you kind of rise to the top and maybe talk a bit about the algorithms and, and all of that good stuff? Sure. I would say the process is, for me, is you have to bring something unique. I mean, if you try and go in to look like everybody else and do what everybody else does, you'll fall into those same mundane kind of circles. But I think the more that you set yourself apart by tapping into what makes you you, the more authentic and, and more engaging audience you can garner to your content. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and a bit about, you know, I found this, as we had a, a brief chat before, and I found this stunning in terms of you get feedback by the second yes. on everything you post. And, and tell, tell our friends here how long you have to resonate with your audience? Great question. So I'll take it back to TikTok, if you guys know what that is. I'm a Gen Zer, so I'm very well versed. <laughs> um, but TikTok actually has one of the most valuable features I've seen a social media platform use, and that's within the analytics, where you can see how long people are actually staying on your video. So if you see a spike at like two seconds of a 30 second video, that means you lost people's attention after two seconds. And then in that case, you know, to improve, you need to work on capturing your audience better in those first two seconds. Um, you know, attention spans are small. Social media is very instantly gratifying. And if you're not interesting, people just scroll, scroll, scroll. And so that's one thing I've had to very keep, keep in mind when I make my content. Yeah, and, and I find this really interesting because at Pearson, we're really starting to put the consumer at the heart of everything that we do. And, I, when I joined the company, I started referring to learners and students as consumers, and I, I have to admit, I got some pushback. Mm -hmm. 
um, because it's like, no, they're students or faculty, and it's like, everyone's a consumer. Right. And we're, a, we're you know, bringing some of my old world into the new world was, was, was kind of my, my new role, was thinking of, you know, everything we did at Disney was thinking about you put the consumer at the heart of, of, of everything you do. Now, you also like to get really creative. Yes. Yeah, you know, <laughs> with the things you do in, in pop culture. Talk a bit about some of the creative um, examples that you've used. Absolutely. So my audience is mainly people my age and younger. So uh, Gen Z, what do we all know? And it's memes, it's viral videos, it's, um, you know, kind of the staples in, in movies and TV shows. So I like to build my content off of what's already popular and what's already being talked about. And so for an example, um, my work is in electric propulsion, which is um, basically electric rocket propulsion. And it's like a space rocket. And it actually looks very, very similar to the rockets that are, are the propulsion systems they use in Star Wars. Has anybody heard of TIE fighters? Exactly, they look exactly like that. So it's a lot more sensationalized in Star Wars, but um, they are real and that's what I work on. And so I did make a TikTok video, which they can roll now, about the Star Wars TIE fighters. Are you a Star Wars fan? Have you ever seen those ion engines that they fly around with? What if I told you they were real? They are. And I'm actually working on this for my PhD. Ain't she gorgeous? So you're just gonna leave out that they produce baby amounts of thrust and like are nowhere near as fast as they are in Star Wars? You and my business? Anywho, yes, they're real. However, they do take a lot of time to accumulate to high speeds. That's because they do produce a very, very, very small amounts of thrust. But they're really, really pretty, and sometimes you can make them turn purple because of the type of propellant you use, and I really love purple, so. <laughs> it's brilliant. Really, <laughs> really <you>. brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. So, you see, two seconds to get someone's attention, otherwise you're just a swipe away, and it's making brilliant content like that. Thank you. It's really cool. Absolutely. And so um, I think that's a great segue into what you do, since you do have a history and a background within entertainment. So I would love to know, do you think that education will ever catch up to what students actually use on the day-to-day -day basis, like Spotify, Netflix, and YouTube? Well, I think what attracted me to the sector was not only just a personal passion for the impact that learning has on society, and I, I think we should never lose sight of that, particularly at this moment in time. I think that's really important. But I went through, you know, a couple of, you know, disruptive moments in, in the entertainment space. Firstly, uh, I use a music analogy a lot because I think it's very relevant to, to, to the world of education. If you think of the evolution of music and you think of a vinyl record with 12 tracks on it, morphed into the digital version, which was a CD with 12 tracks on it. Right. And then you had um, MP3, Napster, and the ability for consumers to, uh, to get the, 12 track, uh, the single songs they wanted rather than pay the bundle of the 12 tracks. Steve Jobs looked at a 99 cent store and went, maybe people will pay 99 cents for a song, iTunes, and now that has evolved into an access model. Mm. Um, where you don't need to own music. And in fact, consumers increasingly in our lives, we will pay for access over ownership. And so you, you pay 9.99, 11.99 a month or whatever it is for 40 million songs on Spotify. Right. And I see that same evolution. And in fact, Pearson Plus is an access model. Um, so for, for 14.99, you can have our entire access to our entire library. Um, and then we'll build, build functionality uh, uh, beyond that, um, and, and I see also the other interesting aspect is by making everything digital, and it kind of fits into, into your world, we can actually start to sort of decompose, just as it happened in music with the albums and songs, you know, what a textbook is, mm -hmm. and actually take it all apart and think of it in a much more modular form. And this has a couple of interesting aspects because it will impact learning. And the way that we teach or faculty teach is, is, I think, really, really important. It also allows us to provide really robust and, and sincere learning experiences at a very affordable price. Mm. It's what I call the sachet 
in the cons- you know we're also we, we we're moving into a consumer products world. Right. People don't like me sometimes as talking about that, but it is you know Pearson Plus is a consumer product, sure. and if you look at the FMCG world, and we've got to think of learning and the world of education through these lenses. Um, if you go to India, Africa, Asia, you don't buy a bottle of shampoo because it costs too much of an individual's disposable income. Right. You buy a sachet. So I ask ourselves internally, how, what do you create in terms of sachet of learning, that sachet of toothpaste, that sachet of shampoo? How can, we now have the digital tools to be able to do that. Very cool. So essentially, you're trying to leverage kind of like bite-sized learning that people can do on the go, and it's a lot more convenient in such a fast-paced kind of society that we have. Yeah, I mean, you know, talking to um, you know your friends at TikTok, for mm-hmm. for example, you take an average. You know, one of the features we put into Pearson Plus is the audio feature because we heard back from students. They want to listen to their books. They want to read their books, sure. and they want to listen to their books at double speed. Mm. Because time's precious, to you, as you well know, and, yes. and therefore, if I can, you know, do twi- you know, the same amount of work in half the time, while I'm multitasking or I'm at the gym or whatever, then that's what I'm going to do. Absolutely. You know, one of the features I was talking to a, a UCLA professor, who said her students demanded that all of her lectures were still recorded, and the reason was the students wanted to be able to play back the lecture at double the speed. So a 60-minute lecture, actually, they can get through it in 30 minutes. And then to, to TikTok, you think about how much information is actually in a 60-minute lecture. Mm. 10 minutes of real re- relevant information, maybe 10 of you. Yeah, what happens if you made 10 60-second modular episodes mm. that fits into the lifestyle that, you, you, know, the lifestyle that, that, that um, you follow? I think all of these are really, really interesting areas as, as the, 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 the sector of education and learning gets, gets disrupted. Very cool. And so do you think that education will ever catch up to the entertainment industry? I, I, I believe it, it, it has to. Mm. Because one of the, you know, the, the, I think there are, the other reason about focusing on the consumer is we have to think about everything being consumer grade. Mm. So... You know, the design of Pearson Plus, for example, is designed, the user interface, that it is as good as a TikTok or a Spotify. Right. You know, we brought in illustrations. We brought this great illustrator that we found actually through Instagram, um, who's an Indian who lives in Peru and has this community of illustrators because we want to bring personality yes. to Pearson Plus right. and, and have everything that we do be, be of consumer grade and you know, learning experiences themselves can use gamification, can use you know, all of the skills and, and tools that have been deployed thus far in um, music and, and media and entertainment. That's really smart, and I see that even within kind of the PhD journey, like the more aesthetically pleasing you can make presenting data, it actually hits home or it, um, it's a lot more understandable for your audience. And so I'm having to leverage artists to actually help me visualize very technical data. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, I think the way that you put your, your, your pieces, your videos together is, is phenomenal. They are works of art yeah, in very concise, every, literally every second counts. Right. And I think we've got to bring some of that discipline to um, uh, you know, the world of learning so that we remain relevant. You know, if, whether it's Pearson or anyone, if as soon as you become irrelevant, mm. then you know, consumers in today's world, we see it in many, many sectors, will move on to something else. Right. And, and certainly, I, I don't want us to be complacent um, as a company. I really want us to, to um, uh, you know, have momentum and think, think um, around, you know, you're going to see Pearson evolve to become essentially a digital media learning company. Surely. You know, that's the way we're going. Right. And I guess finally, my last question is, what do you think education can learn from the celebrity creator culture in Hollywood? It's really interesting. I mentioned earlier, you know, at the heart of Disney is intellectual property. Mm -hmm. At the heart of Pearson is intellectual property. That's created by talent, talented screenwriters, and then it's got directors and producers and actors that would bring that 
that narrative right. to the consumer. We have talented faculty, talented authors, researchers, right. students, mm -hmm. and we need, to, we need to nurture that talent um, and make sure that, that they are treated in a similar way and promoted in a similar way. Also because, as we're seeing in a world that we, have, we live in today, having that unbiased um, approach to learning has never been more important, as I mentioned, to a, a, from a societal impact. Right. So I really think that, um, you know, and we're investing in, in a lot in our, our, our authors and, and our relationships with faculty and institutions as they go through this journey with us. Uh, to make sure that they get the support that they need, that they get the promotion that they need, that, that we are helping drive them into creating the next form of content. Absolutely. You know, thinking around the areas, as you're talking about, using algorithms and using AI, the gamification, you know, um, all, all of these things that we're experiencing in the rest of our lives, we need to bring to Pearson and we need to bring to the world of learning, I think, think generally. Absolutely. So, you know, we talked a bit about, you know, how you study the performance of your content and, and, and what you've been learning, and you, you mentioned this. How do you see your world evolving? How do you, how, you know, what is, here's a question that if we hadn't rehearsed or, <laughs> or talked about, was what do you see on the horizon in terms of where, you know, because ultimately you're not just a consumer, you are a learner and a student. Right. What's important to you in your, in your life? Definitely education in the way that it's palatable to me. Like, and I'm also very interested in creating um, education and knowledge and even the things that I make on my TikTok. I like for it to be digestible by the broader community. And so I think that's where we're heading. Like, TikTok has actually, I think, is leading the way with that, with the learn on TikTok hashtag that has been leveraging so many talented content creators to create these really educational TikToks on so many different topics. You can learn pretty much anything. It's becoming like a little YouTube, because um, YouTube, there's like YouTube University. So I think we're already headed in that direction, and I see us just going further down that path um, and creating just more digestible content for the broader community. Yeah, I think what's fascinating about TikTok is the functionality that it provides, the split screen. Yes. That is now being utilized in education and learning and the green screen functionality. Yes. And then you start to think about how do I deliver a lesson in 60 seconds or less? Right. And start to make that episodic. Mm. Totally starts to transform the way that you think about delivering learning. At scale and and uh, uh, um, at an affordable price, and without all the jargon too, because so many of us walk around only being able to communicate to each other within our fields, but learning how to make content for the broader community, you start to break down a lot of what you're doing, and you understand it better, and you're able to communicate it much better too. <laughs> yeah, well, mm -hmm. I really have enjoyed the last twenty minutes with you. Me um, too. <laughs> uh, uh, please do do follow Naya. Um, you know, you got a quick sample of some of her videos. It was really, really fantastic. As I mentioned, um, you can also um, catch Naya uh, on Learn This, yes. um, mm -hmm. which is uh, you know, an interesting take. You know, the first, tell um, the audience a little bit about the first episode. Sure. So the first episode is tackling sustainability within the clothing industry and how we as consumers can help guide the clothing industry into more environmentally friendly uh, practices. And so um, choosing what you shop to be, you know, more sustainable, reusing your own clothes instead of buying more, uh, you know, additional clothing. Um, it's tackling those topics with our resident expert, who is Maya Penn, who's a very, very um, talented um, environmentalist. And so it's really exciting and really informative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it makes you think, yes. which I think is really, really important. Anyway, thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you. Um, and <laughs> enjoy the rest of your conference. <laughs>